Well, good morning, everyone. I'm John O'Neill, and it's my, uh, my privilege to, to be the preacher this morning, so it's good to have all of you here today. Now, I realize that it's baseball season, but up until Friday, there wasn't a whole lot to talk about in terms of the Mariners. So, uh, so I'd like to begin with a basketball illustration this morning, and it has to do with, with Michael Jordan, uh, perhaps the greatest professional basketball player of all time. One night, in fact, he even scored 69 points in a single game. 69 points. In that same game, a rookie by the name of Stacy King made his debut. Stacy shot one free throw and made it. Okay? After the final buzzer, a reporter asked King for his thoughts on the game. So Stacy King, with his tongue firmly planted in his cheek, replied, I will always remember this night as the night that Michael Jordan and I combined for 70 points. <laughs> I like that. That's a great response. That's certainly one way to look at it. Well, Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan was a great basketball player. And yet John Elliott, in his book entitled Overachievement, claims that Michael Jordan was not really all that gifted of a basketball player. For example, Jordan ranked ninth in NBA for uh, field goals made and 18th in total points. He never ranked first in any major NBA statistic. And even in his prime, Jordan was not the fastest, but nor was he the most accurate shooter, and he certainly was not a rebounder. He wasn't brilliant at defense. Okay? Yet Jordan is considered the greatest player of his era and, Pat, and perhaps the greatest basketball player of all time. So how did a poor defender, an average shooter, get to be five-time NBA MVP, not to mention earning their reputation as the best basketball player who ever lived? Was it passion? Was it confidence? Was it determination? Well, all of these were a part of it. All of them were a part of it, of course. But Michael Jordan, who was famously cut from his middle school basketball team, simply set out to be the best he could be. And the rest is history. There's a part of, uh, uh, of almost every one of us that sort of gets excited when someone attempts to reach lofty goals. There's, there's something about that that we really get into. And the pioneer, the, the successful entrepreneur, the, the winning athlete, all speak about the ability of the human spirit to achieve great things when properly motivated. And somehow that's, that, that's exciting. So vicariously, we sort of share in their achievements and, and we find hope for our own lives as we look at some of these incredible successes. President John F. Kennedy's hero was his grandfather, John Fitzgerald. And he loved to hear stories about his grandfather Fitzgerald's boyhood, growing up in Ireland. And one of these stories concerned how grandfather Fitzgerald used to walk home from school with a bunch of his buddies, a group of his friends, and sometimes these boys would challenge each other to climb over the stone walls that were along the lanes of the countryside. However, there were times when young Fitzgerald and the other boys were sometimes hesitant to dare the hazardous climbs. So they devised a way to motivate themselves to take the risk involved. They would throw their hat over the wall. And you see, they dare not go home without their hats, and so therefore they had to climb over the wall to get their hat. They threw their hats over the wall as a way of motivating themselves to take the risk. There are times, I think, for all of us when we long to throw our hat over the wall. There are times when we, we hunger in our own way for the, for the heroic, whether we want to change jobs, or start a new business, or go back to school, perhaps go on a mission trip, perhaps change our stewardship plan, things like that, whatever it is. There come those times in life when we feel the need to make a change. I know of one young man in particular who decided to make such a change. He was 30 years old at the time, he owned a successful small business, which he inherited from his father. He, he, had, he was secure, he was liked and respected by his friends and neighbors and his customers, and he was meeting his responsibilities. 
But he knew that this wasn't quite where he belonged. He felt called. He felt called to a ministry, a ministry of teaching and preaching and healing. And so, he threw his hat over the wall. Now at first, he met with spectacular success, and his reputation spread with amazing speed. But, but as, as his popularity increased, so did the number of his critics, especially in his hometown. Some of his closest friends tried to dissuade him from his insanity, and his family was also concerned for him. But he persevered. He persevered in his new calling for three years, only to die an untimely death. And as he hung on a tree between two thieves, dying a cruel and unjust death, feeling forsaken by God and human beings, no one, no one could have judged his life to be a success. But it was. In fact, his life was the greatest success ever. For all this took place around Nazareth more than 2,000 years ago, when Jesus threw his hat over the wall, and you and I are thankful that he did. You see, he modeled for us what a life of faith and a life of adventure can truly be. Early in the 20th century, the world celebrated as Charles Lindbergh flew his little spruce wood plane solo across the Atlantic. Now, as he was leaving the last stretches of land in Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, he kept looking down, looking down on the forests and the lakes and the valleys, and thinking that if an emergency arose, he would land in that little clearing beside the river. Or he would clear that little clump of trees and he would be able to land in the lake. But soon, there were no more clearings. There were no more clumps of trees. And there were no more lakes. Only ocean. Charles Lindbergh had thrown his hat over the wall. But doesn't it make it feel good to know that there are people who have who charted a heroic course for their lives and, and actually seen it through? I think there are times in everyone's life when they just need to throw their hat over the wall to be motivated to do something. Of course, no one has ever accomplished anything in life without, without critics. You know, you throw your hat over the wall and pretty soon you'll learn very quickly who your true friends are. You know, who's going to support you and who isn't. Winston Churchill truly a man of heroic stature, was one of the most criticized politicians who ever lived. But Churchill knew how to handle his critics. Perhaps the most famous of Churchill's exchanges was one he had at a state dinner with Nancy Astor, whose own reputation for acid wit and instant responses was considerable. So during this dinner, Lady Astor was compelled to listen to Churchill expound his views on a great number of subjects, all of them at odds with her own strongly held views. And finally, no longer able to hold her tongue, she exclaimed, Winston, if you were my husband, I would flavor your coffee with poison. <laughs> to which Churchill immediately replied, Madam, if I were your husband, I would drink it. <laughs> story, by the way. No one accomplishes much of anything without critics. Certainly Jesus had his critics. In today's lesson from Mark's Gospel, Jesus is still in the early part of his ministry. However, people are starting to take note of him. He's chosen his twelve disciples that will take over after he's gone, and the crowds are growing larger. Momentum is building toward a magnificent ministry. But almost immediately, he runs into opposition. First of all, it's from his own family. His own family. Mark tells us when Jesus' family heard about what was happening, they, they came to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Can you imagine that? Jesus' own family wanted to shut down his ministry and wanted him to come home. And isn't that the way it is, though? You know? I mean, sometimes it's those closest to us who have the hardest time coming to grips with our dreams and our aspirations. Often, husbands and wives especially have problems because of this. I like the story about a first grade teacher who was taking her students on a field trip to the zoo. Each child was given a turn at guessing the names of the various animals. The camel, the lion, the giraffe, the elephant were all named correctly. 
And then it came one little boy's turn, and the teacher pointed to a deer, and he asked him if he knew what it was. He hesitated for a long time, looking unsure of himself, and then the teacher decided to give him a little hint by telling him to think of what his mother called his father at home. The boy brightened up immediately and said, so that's what a baboon is called. <laughs> well, I don't know if your spouse has ever called you a baboon, but I can assure you that anyone who seeks to, to make a dramatic change in their life is going to encounter criticism and tension, and sometimes it may come from your own family. Or it may come from colleagues. Now, in Jesus' case, it was the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem with a poisonous sneer. They greeted his teachings like this. Ah, he's possessed by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. And by the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Well, that's the way it is. Start to make waves and somebody will, will, will wrestle the oars out of your hands by belittling you. One author referred to this as the salt theory. You've heard of the salt theory? Jonas Salk, he was, of course, the great doctor of medicine who pioneered polio research and ultimately found a cure for polio. He had lots of critics to deal with over the years. At one point, he made an interesting observation about the nature of criticism, which seems to hold true for any person who is successfully innovating. Here's what he said. First, he said, people will tell you that you are wrong. Then, they will tell you that you are right, but what you're doing isn't really important. Finally, they will admit that you are right, and that what you are doing is very important, but after all, they do it all the time. <laughs> we all have our critics. We all have them. The best way to answer your critics is to do as the builder of the Panama Canal did. Now, he had endured criticism from countless, countless busybodies back home who predicted that he would never complete his great task. He would never complete the Panama Canal. But the resolute builder just pressed steadily forward in his work and said nothing. Just kept quiet. And one of his subordinates was irritated by all the flack that they were receiving, and he asked the great engineer if he was ever going to answer his critics. And the engineer responded, in time, when the canal is finished. There comes a time when we throw our hats over the wall, in spite of everything the critics have to say. Because you see, Nothing great is ever really accomplished by people who, who value comfort and safety and acceptance above all else. There comes a time for which what is often called a leap of faith. Of course, the greatest adventure that anyone can start out on, the most spectacular and often the most courageous change that can be made in a life, is that of becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now it's unfortunate that for the most part that statement will fall on deaf ears because too often we confuse discipleship with membership in a church. We often confuse discipleship with respectability, but there is certainly no particular risk involved in being a church member or being respectable. But to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, to move from a nominal belief to a radical conviction to move from a nodding acquaintance with God to a, to a complete commitment of one's life. Now that's more challenging for the human spirit than, 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 than digging a canal or finding a cure for polio or even becoming the greatest basketball player ever. I was reading recently about Noel Paul Stuckey's conversion to Jesus Christ. Now some of you might know Stuckey by the beautiful wedding song that he wrote. Now to be among you at the calling of your heart. The rest assured is true, the Lord is acting on his heart. The union of your spirit still is causing us to remain for never two more. The gather in his name, there is none. He wrote that song 
You might also know him as the uh, third member of the singing trio, Peter, Paul, and Mary. At one point in his life, Paul Stuckey was going through a time of searching and crisis, and he was disturbed by the hypocrisy in his own life. And he turned to an old Greenwich Village friend by the name of Bob Dylan for advice. Two things that Dylan said stuck out in Stuckey's mind. One, he said, go for a long walk in the country. Number two, read the Bible. Well, Stuckey took the advice. He walked in the country. It helped him to sort out his priorities. And he read the Bible. Now, his folk group had sung several spirituals and gospel tunes, but, but, but Stuckey had never really opened the Bible before. But now he read through the entire New Testament and parts of the Old. And he had a hard time with some of it. He was slow and often mysterious. But in that process, something happened. Something happened in Paul Stuckey's life. And today, he's living as a disciple of Jesus Christ. He threw his hat over the wall. Isn't it time for some of us to throw our hat over the wall? A certain high jumper was referring to a world record he set in his sport. He said this, he said, I just threw my heart over the bar and the rest of me followed. Maybe, maybe it's time for you and I to throw our hearts over the altar and let the rest fall. It's exciting to read about the early days of Jesus' ministry. He had his critics, of course, but, but Jesus never let them detract from his call. The call he received from God. You see, his life, Jesus' life, is a challenge to our lives. We have been saved by grace, but maybe now it's time to throw our hat over.